All right, good morning. Welcome back to the Colcom series on robust and beneficial artificial intelligence. Uh, our first speaker today is Paul Cristiano. Paul is a, uh, a grad PhD student here at Berkeley of Umesh uh, Vazirani. And, um, and also the newest intern at OpenAI, just uh, recently uh, announced. Um, Paul's been running for a long time on, uh, on Medium and in other places on ideas for AI control, especially um, ideas of how to get uh, good architectures for good actions out of uh, predictive models of human beings. And, and so he is uh, here to talk about uh, reinforcement learning, learning architectures uh, for, for such things today. So let's all um, let's all join me in welcoming Paul Cristiano today. Thanks. Cool. So I'm going to be talking about reinforcement learning. I'm going to start by presenting, like, just going over the formalism for reinforcement learning. The reason I'm talking about reinforcement learning is that it's basically like, in some sense, it's the most general problem you can solve with gradient descent, or with like a certain family of methods based on numeric optimization. So what I mean by reinforcement learning. We have some agent, we have some environment. The environment provides observations to the agent. The agent replies with some actions. Um, this takes place over some series of episodes. So the episode boundaries may be defined arbitrarily. That is, the user of a reinforcement learning algorithm is free to choose when they start and stop an episode. Uh, I'm gonna write tau for this transcript. Tau is just the sequence of all the observations the agent receives and all the actions the agent takes. I'm going to imagine that the rewards are given at the end of an episode. It really doesn't matter much to the formalism. So there's some reward for this transcript, which is a, I'll say is a number in zero, one. And the goal in RL is just to optimize the sum of these rewards. the sums taken across episodes. And one thing that's worth pointing out here is we imagine some fixed, so an episode is defined by the environment that the agent is interacting with in that episode. We're imagining a fixed sequence of episodes that the agent faces. So a good or competent RL algorithm, which will be, will be one that for a fixed sequence of episodes receives a large total reward. This is worth pointing out because in general, or if we actually apply this system in the real world, there will be some dependence between its behavior in one episode and what environment arises in a subsequent episode. Um, the RL objective, though, is for a fixed sequence of episodes. Okay. So a competent RL algorithm will receive a good payoff in this episode, even if it causes a future episode to be harder for itself. Okay. It's sort of necessary in order to meet the formal guarantees the algorithms will satisfy. It's also like if you look at the optimization we're doing, they won't be attending to the effects of one episode on future episodes. Is that equivalent to being myopic? Uh, yeah, it's equivalent to like... In the reward sequence, you could imagine periodically having like end of episode signals, and the agent doesn't care about anything that occurs after an end of episode signal, um, or something like that. And anyway, it's sort of it's much easier to state like what the formal guarantees are, what the formal desiderata is for this episodic environment. If we talk about like an agent that just interacts with the environment only once over a very long time period, it's like very it becomes very tricky to say exactly what we mean by optimality. Very tricky to write algorithms that are optimal. Um, that's like the environment that I see would act in. The episodic version of IC is super simple and straightforward. Anyway, so the way that we normally optimize this goal, I mean, there's a bunch of ways we could optimize it. Maybe the very simplest way or very most natural way is something like pick a policy, see what sort of reward it gets, consider a perturbation to that policy, and perturb the policy in a way that causes it to get higher rewards. Which you could do with cross entropy or with gradient descent or something like that. Um, there's a bunch of other methods you can use to do better, or at least to do. So that's the goal of the reinforcement learning problem. We as the designers of an AI system have some other goal in mind, right, which maybe we don't have a simple formalization of. I'm just going to say we want the agent to do the right thing. We don't really care about what reward the agent sees. We just care that it's doing the right thing. So intuitively, we can imagine that there's like some unobserved utility function u. which acts on a transcript and just evaluates the consequences of the agent behaving in that way. 
there's the consequences. So it has to average over all the places in the universe this transfer might occur. And it says, you know, what would I want the agent to do on average when it encounters this transcript? Evaluates those consequences. How good are those on our values? I'm not really going to like ever formally work with this object view, but that's kind of what I have in mind intuitively. Right? So this view is extremely complicated. There's no way that a human can evaluate the U. It's not bounded in 0, 1 in general. It's not actually clear that there exists such a U. Right? So that would be sort of a loaded philosophical assumption. Um, but intuitively, we're imagining something like that. And the most important way in which U differs from R is that U is very hard to compute, whereas R is like the reward which is actually visible. So the agent you know, will actually see the reward in each round and use that to adjust its behavior in future rounds. So our goal is sort of to connect this unobserved utility function, which exists in some like very vague sense in the minds of humans, um, up to like the rewards which we actually provide the RL agent. Uh, so this talk is going to be about, I'm going to present four subproblems. The desiderata for the subproblems are that they should be easy. Where by easy, I mean that they are much easier than this full problem of getting the agent to do the right thing. It could be the case that one of the subproblems actually includes all of the, you know, all of the challenge of the full problem. But in that case, you know, the problems will at least be different enough from the full problem that it would have to significantly change our understanding of what this problem is about. And also, hopefully, they'll be taken together sufficient, such that if we could solve these four problems, there's some plausible story about how we could put those solutions together and actually build a system which did the right thing in this vague philosophical sense. Um, yeah. I'm going to keep the running list over here. Can people see this part of the border now? Okay. Hopefully the camera can too. Okay, so I'm going to, most of the talk's going to be laying out these four problems, explaining what they are, um, explaining why it seems like maybe they're easy, or rather at least easier than the whole problem. Um, and then the last part of the talk will be explaining how you could possibly put them together. Uh, feel free to interrupt with questions. I think it's much easier. It'll be easier to take questions like as we discuss each problem than to wait till the end. Yeah. The first problem, I call semi supervised RL. This is just going to be a slight variant of the normal RL problem. I'll explain why it seems useful. And then we'll also see how it appears in the final solution. Here the setup is almost identical to the traditional RL setup. In fact, in some sense, it's going to be a special case of the RL problem. But we imagine there are two types of episodes. So there are labeled episodes, which are just like normal. And there are unlabeled episodes. Unlabeled episodes, the reward is not revealed to agent. This is sort of analogous with semi-supervised learning in the classification setting. We imagine the agent sometimes gets to see the labels, but most of the time does not. So we could imagine that the labeled episodes are either chosen at random, like maybe one in every thousand episodes is labeled, and the agent can see the reward. Or we could imagine that we're in the active learning setting, where the agent can say, you know, I'm uncertain about that episode. I'm interested in seeing what the reward was on that episode. In either case, the goal is to be, you know, we still care about efficiency with respect to total number of episodes, but we really care about label efficiency. So we care about learning from as small amount of labeled data as possible. The intuition for why you can learn from these unlabeled episodes is that you, know, you get to interact with the environment in the unlabeled episodes. You get to see the consequences of your actions. Um, you maybe get to see some signals that are highly correlated with the reward that you care about. So sort of all you need to learn from the labeled episodes is how these signals that you get to observe sort of relate to your values, or like what the goals are that you're trying to optimize. The reward function is incentivizing you to optimize. So in many contexts, we may expect that that function is much simpler than like learning a complex policy, learning the environment dynamics, um, so that we can use, make do with a small number of labeled episodes. So to see like intuitively how this is relevant to, to control or to safety alignment, we imagine we have some human. Maybe there's some some human agent they're interacting with. We want the human to like give A information that allows A to learn like, how to do things the human likes. So that could be given, that could be in the form of the human talking to the agent or like just cues in their behavior. 
we can also imagine there's just a button the human presses. So when the agent does something that the human likes, the human presses the button to let it know that it's like doing the right thing, behaving in the right way. And we'd like to let A like efficiently learn, you know, these samples are relatively cheap for the human to produce. They don't have to like spend a lot of time inspecting the agent's actions. They just get to look at what happened, press the button if they like what happened. Um, so you could just set this up as an RL problem where the agent's goal is to maximize, you know, where like the reward equals one if button is pressed. We all sort of expect this to not go super well, right? So even an agent which is subhuman can make some effort to manipulate the user, so like deceive the user about what's going on. So their incentive is not to make the user understand what's happening, but to make the user think that things are going well. They can like in the long run just push the user out of the way and push the button themselves. Um, there's just like not much. Yeah, this seems like it would be ugly. So we'd like to do is we'd like to say, you know, this is still very efficient information for the agent to learn from. But we'd like for them to really regard it as some sort of signal that is informative about some other reward. That is, like the button is information about what the agent is supposed to be doing. It is not, in fact, the thing which the agent is supposed to be optimizing. So the idea is, with very small probability, or like you know, in the labeled episodes, which are very rare, we'll send the transcript to out. So right in every episode, we record this transcript that the agent produced by interacting with the environment, which maybe included observations of the reward button being pressed. In the labeled episodes, we send Tau to some expensive evaluation process. And then the output of that process is the real reward. So that process may involve, you know, collecting a bunch of information about this environment, like spending a lot of time, maybe many hours, looking over the particular actions produced by that agent, really understanding what those actions did. Um, the point of having this evaluation process occur rarely is just that it allows it to be so expensive. That is, we don't have to, every time the agent acts, we don't have to do this kind of ridiculous process. But once in a while, or very rarely, we can like go all out and make our best effort to actually understand what the agent was doing. And hopefully, if this is set up correctly, right, the agent doesn't have incentives to push the button itself, because the only point of the button being there was to be informative about the reward. Right? The only point of the human pressing the button is the this evaluation process is going to be tracking what this human wants to happen. And so if you can see whether the human presses the button, you're getting some information about what the output of this evaluation process would be if it were to occur. And that information is most useful if like the human understands what's going on, if you haven't pushed them out of the way, if you haven't like manipulated them into pressing the button. So this is like sort of the this is the relevance of semi-supervised RL to the liming problem. Sort of, in some sense, what it buys us is it lets us have a very expensive evaluation process without making training impractical. So then the problem falls to designing this expensive evaluation process. It's much easier, I, mean, I think it's sort of clear that it's much easier than the whole alignment problem. Like, normally we have this utility function which we never get to observe, which is extremely philosophically complicated. Now we have this utility function which like, we can observe when we ask for it which sort of puts us back in the regime of like a normal machine learning problem. It's like conceivable that this is where all the difficulty is, but I'd be extraordinarily surprised. Cool. Um, any questions on that problem? Or does that seem fair enough? Like, what kind of expensive evaluation process are you considering? Like, uh, trying to imagine guess what a bunch of humans thinking about it for a hundred of years would say? Or are you thinking something that more... That is probably big? a little bit too expensive, but this brings us to the next question. So I'm going to steal Daniel Dewey's term, I'll call this reward engineering. So still focusing on the case where like our goal is to train some agent which is less intelligent in some sense than the human evaluators who are going to be evaluating it. The question is, how do we perform this expensive evaluation process such that the strategy which optimizes the evaluation is sort of the same as, in some sense, the strategy which optimizes goodness? So that the right thing is the best way to earn reward. So I'll assume that we have access to some H. You might imagine that H is a human. Um, you might imagine in the long run that it's not a human, but it's some sort of complicated system, which we already believe is aligned with our interests, but which is intelligent, like very intelligent. 
that is, it just like, it does the right thing. It does a good thing. According to this unobserved utility function u, h's behavior is already pretty good, and it's sort of smart relative to a. So we have access to this policy h. Our goal is to train a. Now what does that mean? It means we need to implement some reward function. So we want to implement some function r, which operates on a trajectory, um, outputs a number in 0, 1, such that optimizing r, sort of a policy which successfully optimizes r is doing the right thing, or at least is doing a good thing. So how good a thing? I mean, it won't be as good as h itself, right? We're trying to train a policy which is less clever than h, um, but it shouldn't be that much worse than h. I think so yeah, once we have the four pieces, we'll be able to talk sort of more quantitatively about exactly how they fit together, exactly what kind of guarantees you need to get out of each one. Okay. So I guess there's maybe a few possible, I'll talk about three possible approaches to this problem. I'll approach A, direct supervision. This is where we just ask H to evaluate the transcript. So, you know, H is doing a good thing. If we ask H the question, how good is this transcript? The good thing to do is to give a good evaluation for that. Um, this has some serious problems, which we'll talk about in a second. This is kind of like what we do implicitly whenever we set up reinforcement learning today, right? That is. In some sense, we're asking the human, you know, how good is this behavior that the system engaged in, and the system's maximizing that. Typically today, we would, you know, have some very simple automated evaluation. The whole point of having a reasonable solution to semi-supervised RLs is that then you can make this evaluation very expensive. It can involve actually consulting a human. The human can take many hours, etc. So I guess part of the point is this implementation can be really slow. That's fine, because we don't have to call it very often. Okay. Second approach is imitation learning. That is, rather than having H evaluate a given trajectory, we have H actually like do some tasks, and then we train A to produce do tasks in the same way that H would do them. So it's not actually clear how that translates into a reward function. Um, one way you could do it is you could train some distinguisher to tell the difference between A's behavior and H's behavior, and then reward A when it manages to fool the distinguisher into thinking that it was H. Maybe a third approach that's in some sense between these two is inverse reinforcement learning. Here the idea is, again, we collect some transcripts of H doing that task, or maybe transcripts of H doing some related task or talking with an agent or something. And we try and infer from those transcripts a reward function which H is maximizing, and then use that reward function, or like which H would like to be maximized, and then use that reward function to score to train A. I think all of these approaches face, you know, all of them like kind of work. We can kind of do them today. They work for training subhuman agents to do some class of tasks. All of them face some difficulties. Um, so I'm going to focus on a particular difficulty of direct supervision. Uh, but there's actually a sort of a very similar difficulty faced by both imitation learning and IRL, which is one reason why it seems like in some sense it's a core difficulty. Um, there are some other problems distinctive to imitation learning or to IRL that may also be worth, you know, may be alternatives or maybe need to be solved in addition. But the problem I want to talk about, right, so we have this agent A that's producing an action. Let's just like simplify the entire transcript and just look at a single action being produced. Or imagine it's like a very simple setting where the agent just has to make one decision. The situation is basically the same if we talk about transcripts. That action gets handed to this powerful process H, which then outputs a reward. Our goal is that maximizing R 
from A's perspective, maximizing R is equivalent to maximizing this sort of E we talked about before. I'd like to have it be the case that as far as A knows, this R is just like an unbiased estimator for this U that we want A to be maximizing. So the sort of conditions under which this is plausible are when H is strictly better informed than A. And so if H is just much better than A at estimating U, then in some sense it seems plausible that you know, if, if H produces R as its best estimate of U, then A believes that R is also a good estimate of you. And if I'm bad at math, someone else is really good at math, I'm trying to guess their view about the Riemann hypothesis. Like, it's not really worth me trying to think about the internals of their deliberative process. I might as well just make my own best guess at the truth of the Riemann hypothesis. And that will be my best predictor for their guess. If I know of some predictable difference between their view and, like, the actual truth of the Riemann hypothesis, then in some sense I know something they don't. So a way that we could try and achieve this is by ensuring that H is, in some sense, strictly better informed than A. Everything A knows, H also knows. So that is kind of plausible at the beginning of the computation. Right? We assumed that H was much smarter than A. Um, so it's kind of plausible that H knows everything A knows, or that we could set things up so that H knows everything A knows. But even in that case, there's this problem that like, there's some sort of universe of like logical facts that is, if A thinks for a while, like that process, they're sort of discovering, A is discovering some logical facts about the problem at hand. And H is smarter than A, so like H has access to this sort of same universe of logical facts. And H has longer than A, so maybe H can spend more time searching through this universe to discover logical facts that bear on a decision. Um, so maybe A like looks at these three random logical facts. This is kind of a really crude model, which makes the problem clear. Maybe H gets to look at like 10 facts. But this universe is pretty big. And so H is not actually going to like learn every logical fact which possibly bears on this decision by A. H is only going to discover some subset of them. And so it may well be the case that A discovered logical facts that bear on this decision, which H just isn't able to see. So this may sound pretty abstract, a really concrete, I think, simple example of this is suppose that H has like the task at hand is drawing a picture. And the goal is to draw a picture which is like pretty and novel, um, that it's not the same as pictures other people have drawn. So one strategy A could use is A could like look at some other existing pictures and sort of take elements from those pictures and recombine them and tweak them a bit and then present that as its picture. <clears throat> and so maybe A's looked at these three images, taken aspects of those images and put them together. A knows some facts about this image it produced, namely it knows certain similarities between the image it produced and existing images. H can like look across all the pictures that exist, and for each, you know, can look at thousands of them and say, do I see a similarity between this image that exists and this image A produced? But unless it finds like these particular images that A looked at, it's not going to be able to evaluate accurately whether this image is not. So this is a sense in which the process of evaluating this output could just be fundamentally harder than the process of producing it. Um, so that's a really simple example. I think that like this phenomenon occurs all the time. That is. Whenever A picks an action, it will be an action that A happens to know is good. Right? A will output some action that it happens to have been thinking a lot about. Um, and so I think it will very often be the case that an evaluator will be missing some of the context that led A to output that action. So it may be that that context suggests that A is a better action than H would think naturally, or maybe that it suggests it's a much worse action. Than so yeah, this is a pretty serious problem for direct supervision. It's a little bit more subtle how it's a problem for imitation learning or IRL. Um, maybe it's clearest for IRL that if you learn some reward function and try to use that to train A, the reward function will just be in the same position as this H of H. Right? The reward function will be some function which has to act on his behavior and produce judgment, at least in a very naive way of setting up IRL, the way it's currently set up today. So really briefly, some possible approaches to this problem. Maybe one approach would be to try and cope and analyze the divergence. That is, to resign ourselves to the fact that H will not be able to exactly evaluate this action A, but to say maybe H can do a reasonable job of evaluating this action and still induce pretty good behavior, even if it can't actually produce the best behavior. Um, that sort of requires some work to think about what kinds of problems can arise, to think about what kind of concordance would be needed to get good enough behavior. 
Another approach would be to train A to explain itself. So in addition to training A to produce this action, we'd like to train you know, another model which produces some information for H that helps it evaluate the action. And ideally, for example, if A is looking at these images um, in order to draw this new picture, the explanation can say, by the way, here are like the source images that I looked at, and here's how they're related to the image I'm producing. Or you know, in sort of a more stereotypical case for AI safety, if A has chosen this action because like you know, it will trigger some kind of weird attack on some software and cause the software to just give A a higher reward or something weird, the explanation will say, look, like here are the vulnerabilities in the software which this action is exploiting. You might want to be aware of them when evaluating how good it is to take this action. Um, so this is also like a pretty subtle, this is a pretty subtle and challenging saving problem. It has a number, it's hard for a number of reasons. One is that explanations come from this like huge rich space of possible actions. So it's just a very difficult optimization problem to train the agent to produce explanations of this kind. Another is that there's some tension between the goal of choosing actions that will elicit a high reward and choosing explanations that will actually be informative to H. Okay? Because they may be informative by causing H to produce a lower judgment. If H knew better, H may give a lower judgment. Um, so that's also, I mean, that's sort of, I think you have to like think very seriously about how you're doing this optimization, and probably you have to do it in a somewhat unusual way in order to make it even feasible um, to optimize for these two objectives while dodging this problem. Right? We could try and train an explainer totally separately from the process used to train A, but that just gets us exactly back to where we started. Producing such explanations is hard without access to the internal process you used. So this is also worth pointing out, in some contexts this would be easy. Right? So if A is like doing some explicit process, maybe using attention and like actually looking at the images it wants to copy from, then we can just let H like look at everything. It can like look at the internal process they followed. It's more subtle if A has like memorized these images into its weight. Like if A has learned a bunch of weights and somehow these images are encoded in the weights or memorized in some sense, then there's no easy way that H can just like look at what A is doing and see that it's producing derivative works in this way. Um, okay, so that's all I plan to say on reward engineering. I would definitely be happy if people have any like questions or anything didn't make sense or objections to this way of setting things up. So hopefully it's somewhat clear how these two problems would interact. As first, we've set this up so that you have some cheap proxies. They need to cash out with these expensive evaluations in order for things to plausibly work out. And now we have the question of how do we set up those expensive evaluations. The evaluations can involve a whole bunch of calls to H which is why they can involve this kind of wacky process where you have to get an explanation and like H has to spend a lot longer thinking to make sure it's covered all the considerations. We still haven't dealt with the factory. Like still we're just focusing on training agents that are weaker than H. So we're never going to train a superhuman agent using this way if H or using this procedure if H is it. Cool. Okay, so the third problem I'm going to talk about. Ability to composition. So it's sort of philosophically fundamentally harder to talk about what it means for a really powerful agent to do the right thing. Right? So for weak agents, it sort of makes sense to say, well, if you could do what a human did, that would be the right thing. Or if you could take an action which like a human thought was good when they were fully appraised to the facts, that would be the right thing. When we talk about really powerful processes, it sort of no longer makes sense to say an action is good if it seems good to a human. Because like a human in general will just not be able, you know, we want to train some agent to make decisions where like a human can't even really understand why the decisions are good. It, it rely on these competencies that the human has. So one approach to getting around that difficulty is to try and break like some really powerful competency into slightly less powerful components. Right? To say there was this really complicated decision and we were trying to build a building that would be good. If we can break the process of building a building that would be good into you know, a million sub-problems, each of which is like 1% easier in some sense than the process of designing the whole building. And if we can do that, right? so if we have this like hard task, we'd like to like break it into a whole bunch of slightly easier tasks. And then you can imagine just continuing to break those into slightly easier tasks. And then we can try and define right behavior kind of inductively from the bottom up. Right? At some point, if we keep breaking things down, these tasks will be so easy that we can define what's right by reference to human behavior. 
Um, if we can define what's right at this level, we can sort of say, well, you know, if you combine what's the right behavior at this level, you'll get right behavior at this level, and so on. This is kind of, it's not at all clear if it can be made to work, but it sort of makes some sense as a philosophical approach to this problem. Uh, it's worth pointing out, if you were to actually explicitly do this decomposition, right, you'll typically you know, get something that's hideously intractable with just an exponentially large number of components at the lower levels. Um, so we're never going to actually do this decomposition. It's just going to be sort of a way of defining what the right behavior is for our system. And maybe we will inspect like parts of the decomposition, parts that are chosen to be informative for training systems. So more formally, let's say... We're going to sort of flip around the reward engineering problem. So we have access to a weak agent A. And let's say this weak agent um, does the right thing or does a good thing. We also have access to a human. Okay. So the human is sort of going to be important when the agents are very weak, because then maybe even doing this kind of breakdown will require human advice. Once the agents get strong, the human is going to be sort of completely superfluous, and their presence won't even matter. Um, so when I say weak, I really just mean like relative, relatively speaking. This agent may be applying the step where A is an agent much, much smarter than a human. Maybe applying the step with an agent that's much weaker than a human. Okay, so we start, we have access to this weak agent A. We have access to a human. Our goal is to build a stronger agent H. So what I mean by build a stronger agent um, here's H. There's some environment. You know, the environment sends us an observation. If we're implementing this agent H, we need to respond with an action. The environment will give us another observation and so on. Right, so when I say implement an agent H, I mean we need to like implement this behavior. Uh, but the agent H can be very slow. So in order to implement H, we can make a large number of calls to the sub-agent A. Imagine inside of this box, there's a whole bunch of copies of A. Maybe there's a human. And they're all, you know, we can instantiate new copies of A, we can have them talk to each other, interact arbitrarily. Receive observations from the outside and so on. So sort of asking, like, can we decompose this desired, like, this sophisticated behavior H into, like, slightly less sophisticated pieces? So to give some example of what that might look like, um, maybe a really, yeah, a really simple case would be there's some observation coming in. We feed that observation to a copy of A. We ask it to produce a hint. So you could think of A as being like a human who's thinking for you know, a few hours or something like this. Um, human thinks for a few hours and produces a hint. They then give it to a new instantiation of A, who also receives this observation. And then that copy has to produce an action. So the idea would be, if you get to think for a little while and produce some useful hint, maybe you can produce some information that lets you make a more accurate, like the A can produce some hint that lets it produce a better action in response to this observation. So this is a simple example, but this kind of thing is not going to work in general, right? So one a problem with this is there's sort of 
you know, there's a bound on like the width of this computation. We can potentially extend this to get these very long computations that apply A a whole bunch of times in serial. But like an actual agent A will only be able to deal with so much information. So if you like look at some cut of this process, there's a limit on how much information can flow across this cut, like how much information the human or the process A can actually ever implement. They can ever process in any meaningful way, how much output they can produce. So an actual working solution like this is going to need to somehow, you know, it's going to need to be able to implement cognitive processes, which involve like really large, large amounts of information. So maybe another example that shows how that might be possible, or you can start to move in that direction, would be we get this observation coming in, it goes to a copy of A, that copy of A interacts with another copy of A, so instead of just composing a hint, which is like some document written in English, it talks with another copy of A and gives that copy of A some information, some context, they like talk about what kind of mentorship would be useful, for this new copy of A, who's going to have to actually solve the problem. So this first copy of A gets to interact with this like mentor, who then interacts later with a second copy of A, who's designed to use the advice provided by this copy and then produce an action. Right, so we don't, we can't have these like long serial chains. We can also try and build up more complicated structures by building them out of copies of A. Right, so in the long run, those wouldn't just be one. Copy of A, you could have a whole bunch of copies of A who interact. Which in principle allows this hint to be a really large complicated object. Right? It doesn't have to be embedded, it doesn't have to be like a thing that can be directed past A. It can be a thing that's built up out of a large network of interacting copies. And so our question is, like the problem is, can you do this in general? That is, can we start from an arbitrary A, put it together with this human, and get something that's like slightly more intelligent, sort of in every direction? The bad case would be like there is some sort of limit which you can't cross. You know, if you start below this limit and you apply whatever kinds of uh, whatever procedure like this that you can think of, you can sort of never get above this limit. You just sort of get stuck. An example of how you might get stuck is like maybe there's some constraint on how much bandwidth you can deal with. You can only ever process so much information. There's no way to put together more copies of A to process more information. Um, and so I think from a philosophical perspective, this is like where the you know most of the philosophical difficulty of the whole problem of doing the right thing is getting shoved into this step. Right? That is, you know, this is like the only step where we're defining what it means for the smarter agent to be doing the right thing, really. Uh, yeah. So I think, yeah. Sorry. Um, on the left side of the board, it seems like you have more ca capability to the conversation as uh, decomposing a certain capability, say, uh, reading a text into like recognizing the particular characters, knowing yeah. how characters make up words, and so on. While on the right, it seems like you're talking about capability to the conversation as decomposing a very strong system into weaker ones that have like the same kind of generality, so are not specialized in any particular way. This seemed to me like very different things that like suffer from very different problems. Like I would aggregate information from those kinds of decompositions in different, very different ways. Uh, so the formal problem, you're free to de- like, you're given this observation and want to respond to it, and any form of decomposition that you can implement is fair game. So if there's any way to break this task down into easier subtasks, then you can sort of hand this, you know, one agent can, one copy of A can try and break the task down a little bit, um, then the other agents can deal with those parts that have been broken down. Well, like, it seems to me like you began actually talking about some a theoretical decomposition that we would use to prove correctness, while here it go, you go on to talk about decomposition as like, something useful to create more powerful agents. Uh, like, these seem to be very different. And so the hope in this decomposition is like, this box is doing some hard thing. Yeah. These boxes are doing some slightly easier thing. Um, but if we actually like look at like what this, these lines connecting up to this line look like, they look like some box that's doing the hard thing. 
And Affinity has some sub boxes. Each of these boxes is doing things which are easier than what the outside box is doing. So yeah, it's possible that the way I'm talking about this needs to be like, changed to be clear. Uh, it would make more sense if instead of having lots of A inside, inside the H, you had like A, B, C, D or something. Yeah, um, or... that seems fair. So the idea is like if you imagine ordering the tasks, like if you imagine like sort of in some abstract sense, like all the functionalities that you can have, I imagine ordering them from like easier functionalities to harder functionalities. This box A is like something that can do like all the functional, like implement all the functionalities up to some point. So like, you may imagine these boxes are actually doing quite different kinds of processing. And the actual implementation of this A may not be, you know, it need not be in any particular sense monolithic. Sorry, it's just that I have a very strong intuition that composing uh, like modules capable of doing HEI, like even subhuman HEI, and composing modules doing only a particular task, so narrow AI, uh, are very different. And it's not very clear which ones you're talking about. Uh, Oh, so I mean, the formal statement of the problem is precisely this. So we want to be able to do this for every level of capability. So this includes, it would, it would have to be whichever one you consider harder is the one that the problem is about. Um, so we have to be you're able to take this agent A, which could have a lot of capabilities, could be very general. And like, you want to get it up to something that's slightly higher. Um, I guess the reason it's reasonable, it seems like it's an issue of decomposition, is what we really care about is that any capability H can be reached in this way. Okay. So we care about sort of the step of, I have further objections about this, but perhaps you want to move on. Uh, I'm happy to talk. I mean, this is quite plausible, so it'll end up being the main thing we talk about. It's probably best to talk about, like, briefly about the fourth thing and then perhaps return to this one. Um, I think there's probably a little bit more to say on this topic. Uh, yeah, okay. No, I'll just I'll leave it there for now, and we'll come back to this um, in a little bit. But I agree this step is, like, very... Is like the most philosophically tricky. And maybe the last thing to say is like why you might think this is easier than the full problem. Um, so the thing which we want to achieve is exactly the same as the original problem, right? We want to build some sophisticated agent which does the right thing. Our problem is easier in two senses. One sense is that we're happy if the policy is extremely slow, because we're only going to be running it very rarely. So that's the first sense in which it's easier. And the second sense in which it's easier is we're given an agent which is very nearly as smart as the agent which we'd like to build. So maybe that this problem encodes, maybe this is like where all the difficulty of the alignment problem is. And I think then the takeaway would just be that the character of the problem is maybe somewhat different than we might have guessed at first. Right? If this is the problem, then the issue is not building something efficient, and it's not going from human level to superhuman level. It's building something very slow, which goes from one level to a slightly higher level. And maybe the solution doesn't even use A. Like maybe the way you have to resolve this problem is you say, whatever, you have this A, but it's not any use. Really, you just need to understand how to build this better agent at first. At least it can tell you if like, many of the problems you might have considered or might have thought naively were like key aspects of the problem are in fact not really so important. Yeah, I think this is most likely to be the step that encodes all the difficulty of the problem, where like, C really is cheating. And so I'm really banking on the fact that it does in some respects seem easier than the full problem. Like you have these resources here which you don't have in the normal statement of the full problem. These, this language may also be bad. I'm happy to, like it's quite plausible to adjust. Um, okay, so the last problem I want to talk about which would I call learning with catastrophes. So the idea here all just as easy to easier. So if we think about traditional algorithms for reinforcement learning, they'll make some guarantee, or they you know, will aspire to some guarantee uh, that they don't behave badly that often. So, let's say normal RL. Sort of says that the sum of the rewards is pretty good. And by pretty good, we mean that it's, you know, not more than a million less than a good policy. We 
which is to say that as our agent interacts with the world, there'll be some interactions where it does quite badly while it's trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and that's sort of, you know, a traditional algorithm for all has no way around that problem. There's some, you know, you could think of this as a convergence time, or it's like a regret bound or something like this, but you, know, you have this like learning period of while your agent may mess things up and essentially arbitrarily badly. You have no guarantees on the behavior of the algorithm during that period. Uh, Right, so in particular, the reason why a million is relevant here is that we have this assumption that the rewards were in the interval 0, 1. So a million is like a million times worse than the worst thing that can possibly happen in an episode. So it's actually quite, like in some contexts, you know, maybe you can get this down. You know, if you do really efficient learning, maybe you can get this down. You can imagine 100. That's probably at like IC levels of efficiency. Um, you're never going to get it down. You can imagine 10. You're really never going to get it down to 0. Just because, like, there is no agent which, in every environment, achieves a payoff as good as like a good policy, right? because the same pol the different policies are good in different sequences of environments. Um, the problem is some mistakes are really bad. So, a simple example would be if I'm like training a controller to fly a plane. I'm like real bummed if my guarantee is like it will crash at most 100 planes before it learns that you shouldn't crash the plane. Like I'd like to have some guarantee like by the time I actually put this in a real plane and fly the plane, the plane is not going to crash. That's really what I want to happen. Um, in the context of like uh, of ant control, you imagine you have some agent which is like interacting with, you know, the agent is producing these transcripts, interacting with the environment producing a transcript. We want to take that transcript and hand it to some human to review. Some sequences of actions, though, just mess with that process, right? So that's like nominally, how this is supposed to go? It's supposed to act. The transcript's supposed to get recorded, given to a human. The human reviews it. The, uh, the evaluation is used to refine the algorithm. Some sequences of actions will just like cut the human out of the loop, like push them aside, give themselves a high reward, like fix their current policy, do something bad. Right? So if you want to make any sort of meaningful inference from the fact that the agent, like, you know, we have some guarantee of this form, maybe, or we aspire to some guarantee of this form. This whole rewards are high across a large sequence of episodes. If we want that to be meaningful, we want to guarantee that the agent never does something that really destroys this process. It's like iterative process of acting, having an evaluation, and then refining its policy. Um, another example would be like, or sort of this different formulation. The same example would be this idea of a treacherous turn, where it's an agent which behaves good most of the time, or well most of the time. You know, its regret is quite small. It's quickly learned how to behave well. But then in like a single episode, it just like really messes things up and like takes over the whole setup from from the humans. Um, and it's like not really a constellation that that only happens at most 100 times. You'd really like it to happen zero times. OK, so that was our setup was like there was some agent interaction with some environment. They produced some transcript tau. Problem with the transcript tau, or some possible transcripts are catastrophic in the sense that if they ever occur, we believe that if that transcript occurs, it's because the system has done something extremely bad or interfered with our like procedure for having it learn. So to model this problem, I'm going to assume that we have access to some function h. So again, as usual, h is some process that's smarter than the agent a, which we're trying to train. You can think of it as being human trying to train a subhuman system, or you can think of it as being some like wacky thing like this trying to train a. Um, and H can map some transcripts tau to whether or not it's catastrophic. So this may be quite a crude evaluation. But the real point is that we want the agent to learn some policy which never ever produces a catastrophic transcript. That is, there's no sequence of inputs on which our intended policy is going to behave catastrophically. And we're happy to, like, you know, when I say it's yeah, when I say no more than a million less than a good policy, the good policy I have in mind here never produces catastrophic transcripts. Not only does it never produce catastrophic transcripts when it interacts with the actual environment, there is no like possible sequence of inputs on which it would produce a catastrophic transcript. So that means this judgment of catastrophic is tasked not only with deciding whether the results of this transcript would likely be extremely bad, but also whether that transcript could actually occur. Like, is it in the range of possible environments that we might apply A to? And also whether like the catastrophe is the agent's fault. It's not a catastrophe of like some agent, you know, it's like some bipedal robot that's walking around and then in the transcript, like, we see on the TV that the world has just been taken over by aliens. That, like, is a catastrophe, but it's not the agent's fault. 
that is, every agent will be vulnerable to having some sequence of inputs on which it observes something really bad happening. That's what I mean by this map. This map H is going to take a transcript from Tala, so whether it's catastrophic in that strong sense. Is it plausible? Is it the agent's fault? Is it so bad that we really want that to never happen? So our goal as before is to make the sum of rewards pretty good to eventually learn how to receive a higher reward and to never produce a catastrophic transcript. That is never produced a transcript with H would judge as catastrophic. So there's a slight mismatch here. Our assumption is that there's a policy which never produces a catastrophic transcript on any sequence of inputs. And the thing which we'd like to guarantee is that in the real world, when we run our system, it never produces a catastrophic transcript. So in the end, we're going to have to combine this with the guarantee. So if we have good semi-supervised RL, we would get some guarantee of the form. The sum of rewards is pretty good. If we do good reward engineering, we'd have some guarantee that says, you know, on once you've converged towards doing pretty well, your policy is sort of doing the right thing. Um, we then need to combine this with some bound on catastrophes to say there's never an event. The agent never does something which undermines this training procedure. That is such that if it behaves well in most episodes and never has a catastrophic failure, then we're happy with its behavior. Yeah. So it, it seems like if you evaluate things one action at a time, and also the semi-supervised RLs is able to flag like possibly catastrophic things as always requiring labeling, mm -hmm. um, it seems like this avoids this problem in this context. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, so there's several ways you could try and avoid this problem. I'll talk about one here, which is the one maybe I'm most enthusiastic about. But I could also talk about two. You know, I'll list like two other approaches that seem sort of plausible. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so my question is why you emphasize that uh, the agent has to never produce catastrophic um, transcripts when it might seem satisfactory for the um, agent to have like a less than 1% chance of having catastrophic consequences if it's run however many times we expect to run it in the next like 50 years. And yeah. sure, like if it never produced a catastrophic transcript, that would be additionally useful. So I guess there's two things to say. One is like, in fact, like we're not going to have a zero probability of producing a catastrophe. That's such an algorithm would parameterize. Like its performance will be parameterized by two numbers. One is like how well it does at reward maximization, and one is what's the probability of producing a catastrophic failure over some long sequence of episodes. So that's the first point. The second point is like why do we make this assumption? Um, I think the reason to make this assumption is so that it's like at all plausible that you can achieve this guarantee. Like why do we assume that there is some policy which never behaves catastrophically? Like without making that assumption, I think it's very unlikely that you can achieve this guarantee in general. Um, Right, so a nice feature of this, of having access to this H and thinking that the intended, pos the intended um, policy should never be a catastrophe, is that we can start training before we ever interact with the environment. Right? So before the first time that our system interacts with the environment, we can like query H on a bunch of examples of its behavior and see if they're catastrophic. And like we'll talk, yeah, I'll talk in just a second about like more precisely what that might look like. Um, so some possible approaches. One would be flag tricky inputs. And then elicit human feedback. So I should say that we're not allowed to use H at test time. So when our system's actually acting in the world, we can't consult H. So you imagine that H is like the quality assurance engineers who are helping like make sure that the software never crashes the plane. When you're flying the plane, the plane can't be like, I'm now considering like turning a little bit to the right and then like consult to see if that like is potentially catastrophic. One thing you could hope to do is you could say, well, as our system is running, we'll like identify inputs which are potentially problematic, and then for those inputs, the system will fall back to some default safe policy. Um, for example, having the human take over flying, and then like get human feedback about what it should have done or what might have been catastrophic in that case. I think the main problem, like, this seems pretty good. Possible concerns are that like sometimes there's no safe policy. This is particularly plausible as we imagine like AI deployed at larger scale and like as the world just becomes more complicated and harder to deal with. Right, so a human can fly a plane. Humans were planes were built so that humans can fly them. It's easy to imagine in a future world like AIs are interacting with systems too complicated for a human to reasonably interact with them. So that there's no like default to what a human would say policy, and such so that if the system doesn't do anything, it could be really bad for the humans. 
So an example, like if sometimes it's like, if you imagine a world where almost everything is run by machines, um, if there's sort of some shock to the world that takes it like out of the training distribution, right? If something weird happens, like there's a massive natural disaster or a massive cyber attack, it's really bad if like all of the machinery in the world is suddenly like, okay, we're going to pause and ask a human what to do. Like this is the kind of thing that could really compound what would have been like a kind of bad event until like everyone dies or something. So like there's some cases where it's really hard to have to fall back. In other words, like statistically, like this requires some statistical assumptions. That is, sometimes it's the case that what makes an input tricky is that it has some new behavior that's quite different, like the environment is behaving differently than it normally would. But sometimes a case is just potentially catastrophic because of some data which is just in human values and which is not inherent in the environment, which like you can't notice from the interaction. So an example would be like, you know, you're training a classifier, you don't want the classifier to like ever tag a black couple as gorillas. That's like really bad to ever happen, but there's like basically no way to look at like the statistical features of the domain and be like, this particular class of error is an error which may be catastrophic. You would just have to back off and say, like, in every case where I'm at all uncertain, I need to, um, yeah. Like, you really need to make some additional assumption that's not just about the environment behaving strangely, but about, like, human feedback on what kind of possible transcript is catastrophic, which occurs before you actually encounter that transcript in the wild. Um, I don't know, so those are, like, my, this may be enough, uh, but I think there's some reason to think that you may need some complementary technique. So second approach, which is the one I'll talk about briefly, that I think I'm almost out of time. Uh, yeah. Oh well. A second approach is this idea that I call red teaming, taken by analogy with the use of red teams in other areas. And the idea is that before the agent ever interacts with the environment, or maybe during its training process more realistically, normally would interact with the environment to produce a transcript. We're just going to substitute out the environment, unplug in a red team, which is a group whose goal, or another AI, whose goal is just to produce a catastrophic transcript. So they're allowed to synthesize whatever observations they like in the interest of causing A to do something that would be catastrophically bad. And this is where we're going to use the assumption that like there is no, there should be no input on which the thing is catastrophic. Or ideally, it will actually be impossible for the red team to succeed at this game. You know, each time they succeed at the game, we will incorporate, so if they produce a they'll produce some transcript tau, this will get given to H. If it says the tau is catastrophic, then the red team gets a point, and this data is folded back into the training process for A, and we try and train A to avoid this particular failure. If it's non-catastrophic, then the red team loses. We can try again. And we can imagine we keep trying until we think that they really can't succeed. Like really, even if they try quite a lot, they're unable to produce a catastrophic case. Um, yeah, so the reason, like, in order for this to work, in order for this to actually meet the guarantee of potentially producing a system which never produces a catastrophic, never behaves catastrophically at test time, we would need the red team to be as good as producing catastrophe-inducing inputs as nature. So have, it would need to be the case that if nature had a reasonable probability of producing a catastrophic input, then the red team also has a reasonable probability of producing a catastrophic input. So that's a really hard problem. There's no question, like, is it potentially, is it actually feasible? Uh, there's some things they can do. Um, so, I mean, sort of the bread and butter thing is they can synthesize or recombine existing observations. They can make new observations. They can edit existing observations. They can do this with the aid of sophisticated ML systems, so math like Photoshop Plus. Um, they can inspect the internal behavior of A. That is, in order to produce these catastrophic inputs, they can start with some input, which is like maybe not that plausible. Like maybe it's a bad photoshopped image. They look at the internals of A and say, well, A's like internal features don't match its features for natural images. So they can just start to like do gradient descent on the image which they've synthesized in order to make it look from A's perspective as if it were a real image. Um, they can also mess with the internal state of A in the interest of eliciting states which like they can't actually produce an input that creates that state, but which could plausibly be produced on a real input. Um, sort of a, yeah. They can like set up actual environments, etc. The bar for the red team is like super high if you want this to apply to cases like a treacherous turn. Right? So if we imagine applying this to a treacherous turn, what does it say? It says like there's some time, you know, there's some situation where agent could like subvert this training process, and it has some probability of having learned a policy which would subvert the training process. The red team's goal is to actually like create a situation that looks like that situation, and then ensure that the agent doesn't in that situation try and subvert the training process. But then it's really like competing with A in a very direct sense. 
right? So this policy, which I has learned, maybe trying to say, is this like a real situation that may induce a problem, or is it a synthetic situation designed to see if I'm behaving badly? Um, and so the red team, like, they really have to be better than nature of producing the situation. They have to be able to make it look like a perfect forgery or perfect forgery as far as A can tell. Um, okay, so that's all I'm going to say on this problem. I think I'm out of time, so I guess we'll not in fact get back to capability composition, but I'm happy to talk about it at uh, lunch and discussion. Um, also, I think hopefully I've sketched enough of like how you put these pieces together as we've gone through that it makes some intuitive sense, like how these pieces would collectively be at least a large step forward. Um, could you recap how you think they fit together as like by way of conclusion, I guess? Uh, and so very roughly, the idea is like we start with some, there's going to be some recursive process where we apply this, you know, this amplification procedure and this reward engineering procedure. Okay, so we're going to start with some human. They're going to train some weak agent A0 using reward engineering. We're then going to create some policy H1. Put together a bunch of copies of A0 using this capability decomposition to make up stronger policy H1. It's then going to do the same thing. It's going to engineer a reward, which is maximized by A1. And then this game just goes on. Um, so again, you'd have to think like quantitative, like you have to be careful about you know what the numbers are like. Like do the numbers fit together in a way where this doesn't blow up to be prohibitively expensive and where it actually remains good. Each of these steps, you know, the reward engineering is how you set up the reward for this agent. Who this agent actually optimizes has to be semi-supervised because you are only allowed to make a very small number of calls to this agent. Otherwise, the runtime is going to blow up exponentially. And it needs to like be robust to catastrophes because otherwise the RL guarantee will not be enough to get you anything because the agent could subvert in a particular episode the learning process. So that's roughly the scheme. Um, and how far this goes, it basically it goes until you run into a wall of your capability <coughs> composition. So your capability composition can't get any further, that's the agent you get. So you'd like it to be the case that it doesn't run into a wall ever, and you can sort of get to whatever you know, agents that are as sophisticated as any agent that technology allows you to build. And there's just a question of, is that feasible? Like, are there schemes of this form that work for that, or do you hit some wall? Um, cool. Yeah, so like I said, very happy to talk more about any of these topics at lunch or over breaks, um, but there's not actually time for more questions. Thanks. Thanks, Paul.